Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we had a terrific panel uh, on civil military relations, but I'm super excited about our next speaker, our fireside chat with uh, General Mattis. If there's anybody who doesn't need an introduction, I think it's uh, General Jim Mattis. Uh, we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of things, but we're going to start out talking about his book. Uh, if you don't have it, you need to get it. Here's the good news is that it's coming out in paperback next week. Uh, you know, and I bet you when you read it, you'll have it all marked up and, and tabbed and everything else like I have, or like I've done. Uh, there's like a, a million General Mattis stories out there. I'm only gonna tell one, sir, uh, with, with your permission. Uh, it, and it has to do with uh, my retirement ceremony. Uh, General Mattis was kind enough to attend that. And for a lot of reasons, he was the only other four star there other than uh, the, the general who was conducting the ceremony. And it was being conducted in DC. And in the midst of, I was up there pontificating, giving my reflections on my career and, the, and General Mattis was in the, in the first row, pretending like he was enjoying it, but uh, the fire alarm went off. And uh, those of you who worked in DC know that fire alarms don't mean a whole lot in a government building. So of course I continued speaking. And my executive officer came up and I could see his security people were whispering in his ear and he was just sitting there smiling literally like this. And my exec came up and she said, uh, hey, General Dunlap, General Madison's security people are getting really nervous. And I go, why? And she says, well, the fire alarm. I go, fire alarm. She goes, well, it's an actual fire. <laughs> and the thing about it was General Mattis was sitting there. I'm sure the security people told him he wasn't even thinking about moving. And, and we, we did eventually, you know, address the, the fire and, and get back together. But I think that's one of the things that is very unique about him. I mean, he developed, even with people who disagree with him, and I think he'll tell you that you know, during the course of our career, we, we dis disagreed a few things on, on a few things. Um, but he has this uh, natural charisma, especially with people in the armed forces that that is, I, I don't even know how you can package it. In fact, I'm going to ask him, is there things people can do to, to kind of develop that? And he, uh, and just to give you one more example, uh, about two years ago, or about, a, yeah, I guess about two years ago, uh, I hadn't spoken with him for a while because he had some other job in the Pentagon he was down. I can hardly remember what it was. And I got called up by a reporter and they were talking to me about him. I said, there's nobody I knew in my military career who had as much charisma as him. And um, he, um, I said, you know, if he called me up today and said, jump out the window, I, you know, I'd say head first or feet first. Well, the very next day, and this was after he had finished that job in the Pentagon. Very next day, I get a phone call, and I look on the on the uh, on the phone. And it says Jim Mattis, and I involuntarily stood up and looked out the window to see how far down I was going to have to jump. Anyway, uh, with that, uh, General Mattis, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, if we could go ahead and unmute him, uh, sir. Uh, hey. Good to see you. Good to see you. You must have had an early reveille. I, I want people to know that, uh, you know, you're on the West Coast and what is it like seven o'clock or six o'clock or something like that? Uh, it's seven. It's no problem, Charlie. After after 40 years of what you and I did, you know, we, <laughs> you know, five o'clock and half the day's already gone. You know, you, you're at it. So no problem. It's good to join you all. Well, it's great to have you here. Uh, let's jump right into it because and just for everyone, I, I really do want to want to do a better job at getting to the audience questions. But I would like to jump into into it about your book. You have, you know, there's it's filled with leaders leadership lessons. If you had to pick one, what what is the most important leadership lesson that you know you would you would share with the with the group, and which include a lot of young officers and law students. Yeah, uh, thanks, Charlie, and, and thank you for having me here. You get to uh, the age you and I are at, and our, we, we really have a lot of sense of purpose, and we get to talk to young people and pass on all the mistakes we made and 
tell them not to make ours and make their own. So, uh, they, but it was it was a leadership uh, education. The U.S. military uh, prides itself on that. I know of no organization that spends more time actually developing leaders and uh, and encourages everybody to uh, take uh, responsibility for their own development. So with some 40 years of the American people paying my tuition, uh, the one I would, I would lead off with, Charlie, and of course, leadership is so complex, there's millions of things that, that feed into it, but it's how you delegate. How do you actually create an organization where you reward initiative, where you delegate responsibility to the lowest competent level, and as soon as you determine that level, uh, you work hard to develop even lower levels of competence. You actually go down and teach me. It's not a mystery. You teach them how to look two levels, three levels above themselves. And as you get that kind of a sense of ownership of the mission, down in my case to your youngest sailors and Marines, you can delegate more and more to them. And now uh, on a battlefield or in any competitive situation that you're in, uh, opportunities open and close rapidly. And now you have young people down below who are taking advantage and the bias for action just seeps through the organization. Now you have to remember that it doesn't take benign neglect. Uh, you, you're, you don't delegate responsibility for it. You're still responsible. But keep pushing the, the authority to make decisions to lower and lower levels and it will reward you uh, eventually, it'll even make you a four-star general. Uh, you know, I yeah. Let's be let's be right up front about it. I'm a pretty average marine. Uh, I was always in the right place, at the right time. But uh, but my my young folks always got me out of every jam I got them into because they had the authority to do it. And did they make mistakes? Of course they did. Uh, we all make mistakes. I've made more than any of you because my hair is grayer and and uh, and I I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but you're going to make mistakes if you keep all the decisions at your level too, but you'll miss all the opportunities that close before the decision ever got to you. So delegate, delegate to the point you're almost uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I, I actually want to get back to some of the leadership lessons, but that's triggered something in my mind. Do you have concern that given technology today, you know, I can remember when I was on active duty because the predator feeds can go a lot of different places and lots of people then like to become little generals as to the application of force. And one of the things that took place when you were a secretary was there was a delegation down of some more authority to to the field. And some people say that's one reason that it facilitated the defeat of ISIS. Given the modern communication and the politics, it, do you think it's gonna be harder and harder for commanders to comfortably delegate down or is that just something that they're gonna to have to take a risk on as part of command? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know that it's going to be harder uh, if you're confident and if what you've done is trained your subordinates to handle those, those decisions, uh, there's a way that you can probably persuasively explain to people above you why you're doing it. And you still have management by walking around, leadership by wandering around. You're out there. You're actually out there mo mo because you're not back at your headquarters making all the decisions. You're out there monitoring even more closely. But for example, the criticism we came under on, on the defeat of ISIS after my first meeting at NATO as a Secretary of Defense, I realized the big fear in Europe was the returning foreign fighters coming back to their home terrain in, in Brussels or in London or in Paris. And we saw what happened with that sort of thing. It was a legitimate fear. So flying back across the Atlantic, I called the commander and I said, and the chairman, I said, I want you to operationally slow the campaign down and invest each area. We've been an attrition tactic. We keep pushing them back and shrinking their caliphate. Uh, but I said, I want you to slow down and invest surround uh, Tobka, East Mosul, Raqqa, surround it, and then shift to annihilation tactics 
So don't let the foreign fighters out. That's going to be what completely upends Europe's security situation. Uh, in order to do that, tactically, they needed the decision to implement the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement were not changed. You heard that because I delegated, you know, that the rules of engagement were changed. They did, we didn't change them one bit. I think in many ways, because we were taking advantage of the enemy vulnerabilities that the young troops on the front line, well-trained, they knew what they were doing. They knew it was also a humanitarian field, not just a battlefield. They were, they're the best ones to try and protect the innocent. That the ISIS was absolutely nonchalant about murdering uh, throughout the region. So delegate down to them and you, you'll get pressure on it at times, but it's only pressure if you feel it, Charlie. And you know, fire alarms didn't pressure you. And, and, uh, and frankly, uh, you, I, I'm not gonna conspire with those who want me to feel pressure. I, I just don't feel it. Uh, I wanna jump to uh, some questions, especially uh, uh, one of my students, uh, Danielle French, I'm very proud of her. She's uh, not only a great law student, but she's also the Army ROTC Battalion Commander here. Uh, she has a question which actually uh, uh, kind of uh, echoes something that Marianne McGrail, and sorry, uh, Ms. McGrail, if I mispronounced her name. Um, anyway, Danielle asks, looking back at your life's major decisions, is there any decision or action you would do differently upon further reflection and as a result, do you have any advice for young people? And Ms. McGrail puts it this way, what was the most challenging military conflict you participate in and why? I, I don't know if she just means combat or whether she means the, the inside the beltway kind of okay. combat. Well, uh, on Danielle's question, uh, the, the first one, there's always things you look back and you think, you know, if I'd been, if I had the experience I have now and I was 22 years old, what would I do differently? And uh, you have to be competent at your job in the military. The technology, the tactics, you must master that. The, the uh, tragedy of war is such that if you don't, uh, and, and if you don't really take personal responsibility for that, uh, come the day you have to write the next to kin letters, you're not, you're not going to enjoy uh, looking at yourself in a mirror. But I think that looking back, I should have spent more time on history, studying history, studying uh, the human factors under, under stress. I mean, I, I did that over years, but I wish I'd known as a lieutenant, 21 years old, with 40 sailors and Marines in the infantry, I wish I'd had the same appreciation for the human side, Danielle. On the, on the question about the most difficult war, let, let me go deductive here. On the war itself, let me walk you through what it's like and just take it out of theory. I'm fighting in Afghanistan. We went in there right after 9-11. Uh, it's, it's lucrative. The Afghan people are helping us everywhere we go. Um, it's, been, it's been challenging. Uh, I've got 11 nations fighting with me and I get the word to go back to fleet headquarters and we're turning the, the operation over to the US Army that's coming in to replace the Marines and, and some of my special forces. Um, and so I get back to fleet headquarters and there's a plane waiting and I'm told go back to 20, Camp Pendleton right away in California. I say, okay. So I get back and I walk into my commander's office. I'm a one star, he's a three star. I said, Wait, why'd you bring me back? We're having a good time out there fighting the enemy and all and he said, uh, we're going to frock you to two stars. That means they're going to pin you on two stars, but not pay you for it. And you go down and take command of 1st Marine Division and be brought up to full strength, 23,000 sailors and Marines, and get them ready to go fight in Iraq. I said, Iraq, what for? And I think it comes as no surprise to most of you, the U.S. military was not for the invasion of Iraq. I mean, we, we thought it was, it was silly to link it to 9-11. Um, but you keep faith in the constitution, you keep faith that uh, we elect the commander in chief in this country, the military doesn't appoint them. Uh, we're proud of civilian control of the military. And when the decision's made, you do it. Now, drill down one more level. And 
uh, the probably the most difficult decision was to have to lead an attack into Fallujah. We'd had four contractors wander into the town, frankly, who shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, they didn't check in with the Marines and uh, they got killed and their bodies desecrated, but we knew who had done it. It was a tribal town. Uh, I told people in Washington through the chain of command, don't get angry. Great nations don't get angry. We know who did it. We'll get the bodies back and return them to their loved ones. And uh, the tribes in the town who don't agree with this or helping us will hunt down the people who did it and kill it, kill them. And he, uh, then I got word, no, you have to attack the town. And after several days of saying, you really don't want to do this. It's a city of 350,000 people. I got to evacuate it and everything. We had to go in. And then I said, okay, uh, we'll go. You know, you, you have to obey orders. That's why they're called orders, not likes. You don't have to like it. Uh, but I, we were outnumbered in the area. It was a very difficult area at the time, the Sunni Triangle, Fallujah, Ramadi. Uh, but I said, don't stop me. And then deep inside the city with the enemy collapsing, they stopped me. We went in to negotiate, then ordered to pull out. And that was probably the most difficult thing. We'd lost a lot of lads getting into the city. It was house to house fighting. And uh, so that, that was a tough time, a uh, very tough time. Let, let me, well, th that raises kind of a, another question. Uh, during your career, you, you've had to deal, and not suggesting anybody in particular, but you've had to deal with uh, tough leaders and, and even to toxic leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's true, do you have any advice for young folks coming up? of how to, to handle that. And I guess a related question is, how do you deliver bad news to superiors? Yeah, um, on, on, when you get under a toxic leader and the military can breed them, you know, folks, no, no selection process is perfect. I remind people, even Jesus of Nazareth had one out of 12 go to crap on him, okay? So get over it. Once in a while, you're gonna get somebody in there that, that you, you don't like having around, you don't like being on. But you can learn as much under someone like that as you can from a good leader. You learn what not to do. And at times you have to look in the mirror, just like when you're on the freeway and somebody cuts you off and, and after you get done honking or, or grumbling about them, think, now have I done that same sort of thing at times? In other words, look at yourself in the mirror and kind of have a little humility and say, how, what am I doing that could look like that as well? So learn from it. If, as long as you're learning from it, you'll be okay. But the second point is stay yourself, be authentic. A former Marine wrote a book called The Legend of Bagger Vance. Um, and in it, basically uh, he uses golf as an analogy to life. And he says, maintain your own authentic swing. In other words, don't adopt that. Don't let somebody set your climate, your internal climate. You keep your own locus of control as internal. Uh, if you can't find an organization where you are internally saying, I can make a difference here, then you may want to change organizations. Fortunately, I was in an organization where I had great coaches uh, and great teachers. But I, uh, I think that, uh, you know, you, you just have to deal with it with a certain amount of humility. They hopefully didn't wake up this toxic leader say, I'm going to go down and be toxic today. How do you deal with it? How do you convey bad news? Um, in, in some cases, I just go in and say, well, you'll have to have the next commander or the next secretary do that one because I'm not going to, you know, as simple as that. Um, uh, if it's an order, like in the military, uh, I, at, at a very high rank, four star, when I still had to say, sir or ma'am to a couple of people in the hierarchy, I said, well, I don't agree with what you're saying. I will do it and I will do it well, but I don't agree with it. Um, they wanted me to agree with it. So I was no longer serving at their pleasure. So I left, I left the job, but, uh, that, and I, I don't bear them any rancor for it. That's the way our system is. You, you have to have the trust and confidence of your seniors. They, I don't think you're required to agree with, with negative things, but you convey it best 
You know, with, with males my age in national security, there was always an elephant in the room. And if they had not served uh, and they were in national security, there was an elephant in the room that was, they knew that I knew that they knew that I knew why they had not served. I did not have this issue, this problem with women in national security because they weren't subject to the draft when I came in when I was. And I would never have joined the US military had I not been in fear of the draft, knowing I'd get drafted. Um, and so the way I would uh, deal with that elephant is number one, I wouldn't acknowledge it. And number two, I would use historical analogies of how issues, similar issues were successfully or unsuccessfully dealt with to depersonalize the issue. Don't let it be my idea. I'd go to history and bring something forward and say, here's what happened to the British when they tried that in Iraq in 1922. Or here's what happened when Mandela had to deal with that kind of situation under hateful conditions in South Africa. You can bring in something like that, and then it becomes a talk about something out there, not whose dog is bigger and whose dad is tougher or, or any of that kind of uh, usually unspoken but relevant uh, kind of jousting. Back over to you, Charlie. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I think that's, that's a good example of something that I, I know you preach and it's, it's the reading and, and studying of, of history of books constant self-education. And it's important because civilians and military can do it and young and old can do it. It's, it gives everybody an access to a level of expertise. And in fact, the author that wrote uh, The Legend of Bagger Vance wrote Gates of Fire, the, the novel Thermopylae, which is one of my favorites and I, and I recommend it to, to everyone. What are you reading now or, or what, if, I've had several questions from uh, from uh, junior well junior officers and and also on the chat about they they love to know what you're reading now or if you were to just recommend you know two or three books uh, to help get them started or or you think are essential what what would they be? Okay, yeah, good, great questions from your young folks as usual. Uh, the three books that always come to mind that I kept with me, I read, I reread. One was Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. Uh, that dead Roman guy owes me some kind of commission because uh, Amazon is selling more Marcus Aurelius books since I started talking about this old dead emperor uh, than ever before. I bought it for that reason. Yeah, but it's a great book, Charlie, especially if you're going to meetings at the White House, excuse me, so anywhere in D.C. And you're good and you need something to calm yourself because you don't slap somebody in the room. You know, it, it calms you down. Uh, but I would also read Ulysses Grant to see a very humble leader, the memoir, personal memoirs of Ulysses Grant. Mark Twain, pretty good writer, I understand, said it's probably the best book that's ever been written. Mark Twain said that and he became its publisher. Uh, and a third one would be one by a British Field Marshal Slim called Defeat into Victory. It shows that when everything is stacked against you, you still have the choice of how you're going to deal with it. And you can still bring people together and craft a victory out of just a terrible situation, what was called the China Burma India Theater, forgotten theater of World War II, which just saw desperate fighting. Uh, right now, I'm reading a book called The Good Shepherd. Uh, it's been turned into a movie with Tom Hanks, if you want to get cheap on it and go see it the easy way, called Greyhound. Uh, lots of leadership lessons in there. It shows the doubts you feel uh, when you're alone with your thoughts, having to make the decision, and, everyone, or, and everyone's looking at you for the decision. Um, I also read The Daily Stoic right now by Ryan Holiday, a young guy out of Texas. It's doing some great, great work, recommending for your group here. And I keep uh, Tom Rick's latest book, First Principles. And I just read a couple of pages each night before I go to bed about the first principles we founded our country on. But there's a broader issue, I think, Charlie, and that is, you know, in the Marines, every, every new Marine, second lieutenant or private, had, there's a couple of books I got to read. 
Then when you make corporal sergeant, there's some different books, or you make captain different ways. When you make general, they give you a whole new list of books. And and uh, and the Marine Corps is not Burger King where you have it your way. Like you really got to read the damn things. And I'm going to tell you, young cadets and midshipmen who are watching right now, how to make four star general. Uh, fight enemy generals dumber than a bucket of rocks. Okay, uh, if you do that reading. Uh, as clearly as I can see all of you on the screen here today, if you do that reading, that was how clear it was how I was going to go into Afghanistan 350 miles from the sea and stick a knife in their back at, at a place called Kandahar right after 9-11. It was that clear to me because of my reading. So just recognize that you cannot experience enough in your life to be at the top of your game. And yet there's this wealth of experience out there waiting for you. And all you have to do is start reading it. And pretty soon you're circling and underlining and writing in your own notebooks about things that are going to change. So it's a great way to get a leg up on the enemy too. Charlie, back over to you. Yeah, another one of my students, before we leave that topic, uh, Captain Aaron Sanders, uh, he asks, uh, he mentions in your book that you discuss reading Rudyard Kipling, Douglas Southall, Freeman, Erwin Rump, and Grant, and other controversial figures. What are your thoughts on the current movement to decolonize our bookshelves and academic curricula of writers with racially insensitive views? Yeah, if Ulysses Grant is, is controversial, uh, bring, bring on more controversial. No one had more to do with abolishing slavery appointing the first Jews as ambassadors, uh, having the first Native American in his cabinet. Uh, if that's controversial, uh, I love it. Um, but, but the point is, is a very good one, uh, Captain Aaron. Um, you know, uh, young man, I studied Rommel first because I was told you will learn more by reading the enemy's notebooks than you will by reading your own tactics books. This experiment that you and I call America, and for those of you from the NATO countries who are listening in, our allies, our wonderful allies that we need so much, uh, democracies don't exist because we have an ordained right to exist. We exist because the people who fought for us, those revolutionary soldiers in George Washington's army, those airmen at Ploesti, uh, those Coast Guard guys at Guadalcanal saving Marines, uh, those Marines at Iwo Jima, the soldiers at the Battle of the Bulge, um, you know, the Navy at Midway, we're, we're alive because we could outfight them. And you outfight them based on knowing more than your enemy commanders. And so read, know everything you can possibly know about your adversaries know their dance and know their poetry, know everything about them, because somewhere in there, you're going to find a way to go after them. And the idea that we should have colleges where certain people are not studied, are we really that fearful that our young people can't figure out right and wrong? If we are, we got a lot bigger problem. Now, fortunately, I spent 40 years, 40 plus years in the Marine Infantry and it's named infantry for a reason, infant soldier, young soldier. That's how it got its name. I have a lot of confidence our young people exposed to the good, the bad, and the ugly in literature, in history, will recognize one fundamental thing. Good people and bad people have written history. You'd better study all the history if you want the good people to win. Back over to you, Charlie. Sir, and to follow up on that, uh, you're, you have an enormous rep reputation for caring for your troops. And, um, but, uh, and a lot of commanders these days will tell you that their troops are their most important thing and, and so forth. Where does mission accomplishment come in on that? And, and kind of a related issue on that is uh, in your well, let me, how about if you take a, take a whack at that one, and then I, I, I do have a follow-up that's, that's related uh, from your book. Yeah, the mission always comes first. The mission always comes first. 
this, again, this experiment we call America uh, is by its very, by its very life threatens autocrats. And the autocrats right now are feeling the wind at their backs. And the allies, uh, the, the democracies are, are starting to doubt their values. Uh, I would encourage you young people, doubt your doubts, don't doubt your values when it comes to the rule of law, when it comes to the dignity of the human beings, when it comes to people having a right, uh, a country of the people, by the people, for the people. No one has ever made money betting against America, not yet. And so you, you've, got to, you've got to stay on the mission and it'll break your pee pick and heart at times. It got to the point with me, I would tell my supporting panel, do not report your casualties to me during a fight. Uh, medevac them as fast as you can. If you can't continue fighting, let me know, but you just take care of the troops you still have alive and we'll grieve afterwards because I just know it's one of my weak areas. But the troops don't care, Charlie, how much you know until they know how much you care about them because they're gonna put their lives on the line. They're gonna, they've signed a blank check, all these Coast Guardsmen and airmen, all these soldiers and sailors and Marines, they put a, their lives on the line with a blank check to the American people saying, we are going to support and defend the Constitution against anyone who takes it on and the Constitution includes the constitutionally elected officers above you. Uh, we're going to carry this out at the risk of our lives. Uh, the mission comes first. The mission has priority. But what you have to do is figure out how can you accomplish that mission and lose the fewest number of troops possible. And I've actually were on the 30 year reunion right now, 30 years ago today. I was in my third day of fighting in the Gulf War. That was the last time out of 1,250 sailors, Marines, and, and Arabs in my battalion that I brought everyone home alive. I had a bunch of wounded, but they all made it. And so I'm really, today I'm kind of thinking back on that case, and you carry out them. And I was an assault battalion. I would clear the paths through two obstacle belts and minefields. So you just do the best you can to bring them all home alive. And then you you sorted out on the banks of the Columbia River, the ones you lost. You know, um, along that line, uh, and a number of uh, students, my students have asked this question about your book. <clears throat> you talk, and we talked about delivering bad news to superiors. How about delivering bad news to subordinates? <clears throat> and the reason I bring this up is there, there is an incident that you talk about in your book where you had to relieve a, a commander in the field, somebody that, that you, you personally liked and, and it wasn't on an integrity issue or, or anything like that. Could, do you recall that particular part, part of the book? And what, what are your thoughts about delivering that kind of bad news? Yeah, you know, it, uh, it's tough. Um, the, when you get up to being a general, the colonels really are the same as you, they're your peers. You were just lucky enough to be promoted to general. So I'd known this officer, he was a good officer, he was a noble officer, he cared deeply about his men. He cared so deeply, he, he was not aggressive at moving against the enemy, and he commanded oh, 6,000 of my troops, a third of the assault regiment, one, one of the three assault regiments. And I had two assault regiments carrying most of the fighting, we were closing in on the city of Baghdad, I needed all three regiments fully in the fight. I couldn't keep going to these two regiments. And there's a saying in the military, if a regiment isn't performing, you don't fire 5,000 sailors and Marines. You have to remove one. Um, but he was a noble officer. Like you said, there was no misconduct at all. It, his level of zealousness at moving against the enemy was not sufficient. Uh, but you know, on any given day, this can happen. Uh, this, this happened day after day. Uh, the savior of the Union, General Warren at Gettysburg, for example, sees the open left flank, rushes the brigade up the 20th Maine, holds Little Round Top, and Lee basically is defeated, and that starts the end of, the, of our Civil War. It takes two more years, but that is the act. And yet General Warren, in the last months of the war, is relieved by General Sheridan because yeah. he is not aggressive enough. 
my point is, it's not a personal thing, except in the case of malfeasance, uh, but that was not the case. And I, I, you call the person in and don't send someone else to give them the news. You give them the news. Uh, you do it with dignity. Uh, I was concerned about him. Uh, it, it's not easy. Remember, I have a hunt in my division. I have over 110 embedded press. So guess what? This officer, his family, the next day, his name is on the front page of a national newspaper is relieved of command halfway to Baghdad. You can imagine the humiliation. Uh, and I, again, you simply, the mission comes first. You have got to do it. You do it with as much uh, dignity as you can afford the officer, but you do it. Here, here's the thing, the bigger point is, Charlie, that as a leader, you're going to get audited every day by your seniors, sometimes the news, uh, your subordinates, uh, and, and, and all. You're going to, and the audits are not going to be fair. They're gonna be very harsh. And that's just the way it is when you're in a leadership position. But leaders cannot fall back on and say, I did my best. Leaders must do what is required. That is, that's part of leadership. Doing your best is usually, when someone says that, that's usually falling back, if they're talking about themselves, into a defensive crouch. You went to bed that night knowing that something wasn't right and you didn't do what was required. Uh, you've got to do what's required. And at times, it, it, it again, uh, it's not about you. So you have to put your personal feelings aside because it's gonna be rough and, and you won't forget it. You'll lose friends in the process. Uh, you mentioned the press and you know that, that is a big issue for any leader, but especially military leaders these days. Uh, Corey uh, Frontini and I'm, uh, Ms., or Ms., Mr. Uh, Frantini, I'm gonna paraphrase. Um, what is your advice to leaders in, in dealing with the press now? And, and with, when you're sec deaf, how do you balance the need to build a relationship, but also balance the concerns of the administration and, and frankly, uh, the, the military itself? Yeah. Do you have any words yeah. of wisdom for us? I don't know many words of wisdom. One thing, even if they tell you there's no TV cameras in the room, don't ever say, young folks, that it's fun to shoot some people, okay? Because uh, it'll make national news and you'll be on CNN every 15 minutes for three days. And, uh, and I, I just after I got called to Washington to get chewed out and uh, I saw Barbara Starr in the hallway. I said, hey, Barbara. And she said, oh, General Mattis, don't beat me up. I, I had to put it on the news because, I, I mean, I, I know these people. You get to know them after a while. And they're just, I said, Barbara, you're just, you're just a news hack. You're putting food on a table for your family. It's no problem. But gosh, Barbara, you know, every three days, every 15 minutes for three days, you had me on the news. And, and now it's two weeks later. You don't send flowers. You don't write. I mean, is it over between us? I mean, what's going on? In other words, keep your sense of humor for crying out loud. Um, the, uh, the Marine Corps, every time I made a big mistake like that, the Marine Corps would straighten out the problem and then promote me, okay? So don't worry. First thing is, don't worry about it, you know? Um, I mean, with, with deep fakes now, they can have you doing everything from pornography to racism, and just make sure you're not doing, that what you're doing, you can look in the mirror over, and don't worry about the fakery. Just, that, that's the first thing. It's gonna come out and uh, people are gonna believe what they want in this age. But I think too that um, what you want to do is teach your troops that they're all public affairs officers in the in this information age. <clears throat> and I would tell them, now if you're going to start blubbering and say you're going through your second childhood and you're all worried and everything, just stand back and let a tougher guy or gal step forward and represent the Marine Corps in front of the cameras. Uh, so, so don't, don't, don't just share your courage with the American people when the camera gets shoved in your face. I'll give you an example. We're pulling out of Fallujah and a young blonde haired, absolutely filthy, dirty, slow talking lad from downtown got his light machine gun over his shoulder 
and a camera gets shoved in his face says, don't you feel terrible? You, you went through terrible fighting. You lost some of your friends. That was terrible stuff. And now you're terribly told that you must terribly walk out of the city. How do you, do you feel terrible today? And, and the kid just kind of looks in the, I mean, the newsman is trying to get a storyline, obviously going. <clears throat> and the lad looks into the camera and he says, look, he said, it doesn't matter. We'll just hunt him down somewhere else and kill him. I could have kissed that kid right then, you know? I mean, he, he just completely unintimidated by the whole situation. He kept faith in his chain of command. He knew we'd done our best not to put him in that position because we kept talking to the truth about what was going on, why they were going in, that sort of thing. I think what you want to do is be as open as you can with the press. Uh, and when they get it wrong, help them to get it right. Uh, I remember on, on one occasion, they, uh, they, I was un being investigated for bombing a wedding party. You know, a wedding party, 26 all males. Now, I don't, I don't know who was getting married. I'm not going to get into people's choices in life and that sort of thing. But they were five miles from the Syrian border and 30 miles from the nearest town, and they all had guns, okay? So it wasn't a wedding part. I, I mean, I'd kind of deal with it that way, kind of lightly. Now, when I became sec deaf, it was different because now when you speak, the world's newspapers are catching every nuance. And frankly, during this period, uh, you know there was very confused messaging coming out of the White House. So I could not hold press conferences because no matter what I said, uh, the press would probably going to rightly point to uh, cleavages uh, uh, between Pentagon and White House. So I would do off the record things with the press and keep talking to them. But at a time when you you know it, the press seems to also find a lot of tension, they want to find tension. That's what makes news, not harmony. So if I said six and the president said a half a dozen, I knew they were gonna say, aha, the Pentagon and the president don't agree, you know? So you have to deal with the press and not create your own problems. So I would just meet with the good ones and the good ones weren't necessarily people I agreed with uh, off the record and have off the record talk so they could get their questions answered, but it was not putting me at odds with, uh, with a rather unusual president that, uh, that I eventually uh, had to resign uh, from working under. Back over to you, Charlie. Well, you know, speaking of, of the press, one of the most uh, highly publicized things during the Iraq operations has to do with Haditha. And uh, you talk about that in, in your book. And uh, we have a lot of military lawyers and aspiring military lawyers and, and lawyers and, and public in general who are interested in this. And, and in fact, uh, Henry Karras and uh, Air Force Captain Greg Spears have different forms of kind of the same question. What is your view of the role of the military commander in the military justice system? And just to put this in a little bit of context, there's a lot of uh, proposed, there's some very serious proposals these days to take military commanders out of the disciplinary process and, and make judge advocates the uh, disciplinary authorities, in essence, you know, making these decisions. How important is disciplinary authority to a, a military commander, especially a combat commander? And, and do you have any thoughts on those, those proposals? Well, maintaining the military justice system uh, as a commander-centric system is critical if you're going to hold commanders responsible for the good order and discipline of the only organization in our country. Well, one of two, actually. The CIA has some, some role here, but uh, only organization, really, that has the authority to employ enormous violence in the name of the American people overseas. And... If you start diluting that authority, then the responsibility dilutes too. And I can pretty much assure you that uh, at that point, you will weaken the military's cohesion and a, the sense of ownership by the commander from the platoon commander, lieutenant and company commander, all the way on up over discipline. Like right now, if, if something goes wrong in your city, 
You turn it over to the city, pro the policeman turn, picks up the person, they turn it over to the city prosecutor, and they deal with it. And when it's over, life goes on. In the military, the guy comes back to the unit or he stayed in the unit. And somehow we, we're a closed labor system. We, it stays right there. So the whole point is to keep this violence capable unit under strict good order and discipline. And I think that Hadith is an example where for two years, nearly 80 investigators looked into this. There were over 9,000 pages of, of uh, investigatory reports. And I checked in and I was told I would be the, the central adjudicating authority for these. So I began reading. It took me nearly six months. Every weekend, every evening, I would take out another. It came, by the way, in three large boxes. That's how many binders there were. And I went through and I dog-eared them and I was meeting with the, uh, the lawyers, the uh, prosecutors, and I'd circle questions and get answers and all. And finally, I dismissed the charges on most of the lads. Uh, they, under the conditions they were under, it was clear they had done their very best to sort it out. I was not as impressed by the battalion commander or the squad leader. Uh, and they had been, the battalion commander had been fired by my predecessor, rightly. Uh, and all. And so if, if you're not in a position where the commander feels that responsibility, if you turn it over to a legal system, I won't even say justice, because part of the justice that we have now that we would lose if we did this is you cannot criminalize every misconduct on a battlefield. You cannot do that. You, those who have not closed with in close combat in the primitive atavistic world of man-to-man -man combat cannot understand, cannot understand what it's like. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. is probably one of the most articulate associate justices we've ever had in the Supreme Court, deeply marked by his time as an infantry officer in the Civil War, wounded in action. And Oliver Wendell Holmes at a meeting of veterans, people who've actually been there, the most articulate associate justice in our court says that we have shared the incommunicable experience of war. Now, if he can't communicate it, I'm not gonna be able to here today, Charlie, but you don't wanna take the, uh, the, the combat arms officers, the commanders out of the very decision about what constitutes a crime when they are gonna be the ones who initiate the court martial and eventually lead the person when the court martial's over. Uh, and right now, I, who was it? The, uh, the great defense lawyer, F. Lee Bailey, who, former Marine again, sorry about that, Charlie, but one of the greatest defense, civilian defense lawyers in the history of our country. And he says he would rather defend an innocent person in a military courtroom than civilian because they have more rights. It's in his book, The Defense Never Rests. It's early, in, in the first couple of pages, Charlie, not many pictures, so you air guys probably don't, don't, won't be impressed. Actually, I have read the book and I, and, I, and I did meet him and he really was uh, you know, a, a fantastic person. Um, but uh, since we're on the topic of law and lawyers, you've been in a unique position in that uh, as a military commander, you dealt with a lot of military lawyers and, and some civilian lawyers in that context and judge advocates, but also as Secretary of Defense, you're, you're dealing with a lot of civilian lawyers and so forth. Uh, I have a bunch of questions along this line. I think people in our audience may as well. What qualities did you like? Uh, what qualities did you not like? And did you feel that the the lawyers, especially the judge, judge advocates, did they really know enough about your business to be able to give you, meaning, you know, the, the war fighting uh, piece of it, to give you the kind of advice, advice that was really useful to you? Uh, what, what great questions. You know, uh, in the Marines, they're line officers. Uh, we, we've had uh, a lawyer uh, who knew foreign languages win the Medal of Honor 
um, the, uh, the, um, their line officers that go through the training. I never had any problem with my lawyer, my, my JAGs. In fact, uh, I thought they were, they were very, very good at understanding the realities of, of, the, uh, of being in the field and just the, the, the culture uh, very well. Uh, there, there is a line in Michael Balzer's book, Just and Unjust Wars, where he says lawyers to some degree, well, lawyers have created a paper world that too often fails those of us who live in a real world. And I think this is one of the reasons people eventually think we have a legal system and not a justice system, because it becomes more and more, um, you know, you kind of shop for which courts. Now, I learned this when I was Secretary of Defense. There's certain courts you take cases to because we're not really a, a nation of laws. We, uh, there are certain courtrooms where the laws are, we know how they're going to be interpreted differently than elsewhere. But I, I think that I, I, what I needed from the lawyers too was a broader view. And I worry about law school as an education. It's the only, when I think of all the professionals I deal with, generally speaking, it's the ones who come out of law school that seem to have narrowed their view of life and its complexities. Uh, whereas if I talk to somebody who studied history, even the, uh, the physics, guys I would talk to had a much more expansive view of, of human nature, it seemed to me. And I would have thought that law school would be where you would get, I'd actually thought about going to law school when I was gonna go in and out of the Marine Corps real fast before I fell in love with the sailors and Marines. But what I really needed from them, especially as I got to the highest level, SECDEF, and I, and I, by the way, I was blessed with the greatest lawyers, I think, in the world at the Pentagon, the general counsel and that team, they, they, will, uh, they will not let your feelings get in the way. They'll give it to you straight no matter what. But I needed prudential and legal advice mixed together. You can't have a legal system that lacks all compassion. You can't be so passionate for the law you don't have any compassion for human beings, especially those that, that you see at the, uh, at the very edge of sanity, uh, which is what, what a battlefield is. I mean, it, it's an insane place by, for those of, in my line of work where battle is, is very, very close combat. Um, and so I think that the qualities I liked were those who could have both comp legal competence and empathy for this atavistic primitive environment that our lads were in. And what I disliked were the lawyers who thought um, they knew better. I'll give you an example. When I was first getting ready as a one star to go into Afghanistan, uh, the rule of engagement was the enemy had to fire first. This had grown out of peacekeeping in the Balkans and Mogadishu and, and this sort of thing. And I said, I will not land under those rules of engagement. <clears throat> if we could ambush the Al Qaeda and shoot him in the back, I'm gonna ambush him and shoot him in the back. Uh, that's all there is to it. Uh, I don't know what, what movie this person saw, but the, that was the rule of engagement coming out of Tampa. So the fifth fleet lawyer, Navy lawyer came in to see me and he was great. <clears throat> He said, what do you want the rule of engagement to be? And I told him, and he wrote it down. He said, I'll be right back. And he went in and boy, all hell broke loose in Tampa. I'm in Bahrain at fleet headquarters. And he got it changed is the bottom line. And we went into uh, Afghanistan and it was very clear. The president of the United States had declared the enemy hostile. We were to take them out. And how we got into a position where lawyers were saying we had to be shot at first it was, was something out of some bizarre fantasy land. And fortunately, we had other lawyers who were able to restore some sanity. And then when the person wouldn't, wouldn't buck, uh, we took it up the operational chain and they said, we told you to do what? Oh my God, and Tampa immediately changed it. But that shows the problem if you have lawyers and, and, and I know this lady meant well down in Tampa. But I mean, it was kooky is the bottom line. So I, I don't like it when people are out of touch 
with battlefield realities. Michael Walzer's point about writing rules that don't bear any resemblance to the world the rest of us live in. Back over to you, Charlie. Yes, sir. Um, I, I've got to ask this one. Um, uh, well, two questions, uh, and we, this may take us to uh, game time here, but um, we've been talking a lot about civil military relations, the whole last panel was on it. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about mandatory service, national service. Uh, what do you think about that? And, and thinking about it in the context of something I, I raised before, we're trying to get you know, more diversification in the armed forces uh, and it is a selective service. Should we select people you know, based on currently only males are, are subject to draft reg registration, potentially draft? Should we select females so that we have a better, you know, more parity in terms of the armed forces? What do you think about conscription or mandatory service? Yeah, you know, I, um, the, the reality is we do not live in an age when the government is trusted enough uh, to employ uh, a, a conscription type thing. The, there is not a clear and present danger, but more importantly, you'd have to look at what is the specific military problem you're trying to solve. Because as much as we want to talk about the military being representative, 71%, trending towards 73% of the males in this country, 18 to 24, cannot qualify to serve as a private in the US Army. That's, that's the baseline Army regs that all the services go by. 71 or 73 percent. Now, obesity, licit and illicit drug abuse can't pass the test with the education system that is continuing to fail us as a country. But my point is that there's a whole lot of people that we, we don't, we can't bring in. But I don't think that uh, national service should be dismissed. I've, I've gone uh, back when I was in, uh, in the Marines and manpower in the Marines. Uh, I actually met with uh, Native American tribes at the National Powwow, the Navajo Code Talkers had a sit down with how did the Indian tribes in many cases denied their land, their religion, their language. How did they keep their tribal identity at a time in the Marines, we saw the US military going for non-military reasons to be used for social purposes, knowing that on the battlefield, some of these things would be dangerous uh, that were, were being implemented. And between the tribes, and I went to the Mormons uh, and talked to them, how did they get their young men and now young men and women to sign up for missions at age 18? Because it's the same age group we look at for a lot of our military men and women. And I think what we have to look at is a point that you brought up in the last uh, effort and Peter Fever did about national service. I mean, if someone's willing to go teach on an Indian reservation or inner city school, if someone's willing to do something else, I, I think we should have national service that says when you come of age, uh, you owe something to this country. A country's like a bank. You, you, if you're going to want to take something out of it, you got to put something in. And it should not be uh, restricted to the military. Now, I realize that the military has become less representative as a result of self-selection, but it's still probably one of the most diverse workforce we have in America. So I would not be too concerned when we have a higher minority re-enlistment rate than we have of the majority uh, in the military. Clearly the minorities think they're getting a fairer shake here than they can find elsewhere. They're voting to stay with it. And I think we wanna create a national service construct, not a military service conscription as we deal with this broader issue. I, I know that's probably a longer answer than you wanted, Charlie. Did I touch on what you were concerned with there? You, you, you did, uh, and, and I think it's, uh, you know, one of the challenges now is, is trying to diversify the senior leadership. And, and I, 
hard to know how to how to do that without expanding the pool. But but th those are great ideas. Let me. Uh, uh, Ellie Stutter, who's one of my students, uh, she asks, what do you think is going to be the biggest uh, priority in terms of national security? She puts it in terms of national security law uh, in, in the coming decade. Uh, and my own observation is I, I thought it was interesting that uh, Sec Secretary Austin said that his number one priority was fighting the coronavirus, uh, which surprise me. What, what do you think uh, strategically our biggest challenge is and maybe you know, tactically for, for one of a better term in the near term, what, what should we in the national security enterprise be focusing on? Well, big questions, uh, Charlie and Ellie. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I think if you broke out the threats to our country internal, remember the military swore an oath to uphold and support, defend the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Domestically, my biggest concern is the scorching rhetoric, the divisiveness, the lack of trust and fundamental friendliness, lack of respect for each other. I mean, you gotta remind people even a broken clock is right twice a day. Maybe the person you're talking to might have something to offer. Um, uh, and, uh, and related to that is this national debt. And for you young people, you ought to be madder than hell about what people with my color hair are doing. We're, we're taking government services, we're running up a national debt so high that it's intergenerational theft. And we're saying, here, you pay this. And by the way, you young folks with all your good ideas, when we were growing up, we had a good idea. There's plenty of venture capital out there. If interest rates go back to their traditional level, we would be paying right now today more interest on our national debt than we pay for the entire US military every year. We do that every year. And that money's going to Riyadh, Moscow, Beijing, Tokyo. It's not all going to our friends. Those I think are the biggest threats to our democracy right now. If you look at strategically, Terrorism is an ambient threat. It's going to be here. How do we deal with it? And if we can keep weapons of mass destruction out of their hands, they won't change our way of life. But how do we deal with it without losing our constitutional uh, rights is going to be the challenge. In terms of urgency, it's North Korea. There, uh, he has now got missiles mated to nuclear weapons. And in terms of power, it's Russia, raw power, nuclear weapons. It's Russia under a, an increasingly brazen uh, mucking around in our elections president they have, Putin. And Putin is not Hitler. He's a creature out of Dostoevsky. He sees threats all around Russia. And we're the only country that can help Russia is America. Only country that can help. The Europeans are scared to death of Russians. The Chinese want them for a rump state. Their demographics are worse than horrible. And the kleptocracy is ruining the economy. So Russia is a near to midterm concern. But in terms of political will, it's China. And the increasingly authoritarian uh, mode at home by the Chinese Communist Party, it's wolf diplomacy abroad. Uh, it's piling debt on other countries they can't repay. Uh, that's going to be the, the strategic threat in the longer term. Uh, but um, how you deal with this, how you deal with this uh, at home, you start listening to one another and working with one another, and you follow George Washington style leadership. I'll hit that in a minute. But abroad, I'll give you three words for how we deal with climate change, strategic adversary with nuclear weapons, North Korea, terrorism. The three words are allies, allies, allies. And I got over enjoying public humiliation by second grade. And that, as you know, is the reason I, I resigned my position at the Pentagon, uh, best job in the world in terms of working with our troops. So how do you actually lead in a time like this? We're gonna wanna close on leadership, Charlie. Take a look at George Washington, who is, is one of the most boring people to study on leadership because he constantly does the same thing time after time. 
How did he take a bunch of free men who say we're taking orders from no king, weld them together into a revolutionary army that with French help was disciplined enough and capable enough to humble the redcoats who would defeat Napoleon a few years later. And here's how he did it. He would listen to others, not just listen to them and then go off to what he's going to do, but listen to them with a willingness to be persuaded. Remember that, my fine young leaders. Listen with a willingness to be persuaded. He would learn from them. And by listening and learning, he was showing respect. And then he would help them. He would find a way to help them. And only then would he lead. America is best as a team player. Let's go back to listening to others with respect. Don't declare some people, um, what was it here, uh, controversial so we won't study them. Uh, listen and learn, then help others, help them, really help them, and then lead them. Let me uh, go back over to you, Charlie. Sir, uh, we got a... Uh couple of questions, one from Mari Dugas, one from Peyton Coleman, and there's probably other here. And just so everybody knows, I'm, I sometimes try to summarize questions I see here. Uh, you, you, you talked about some of the challenges that you've had with some of the lawyers. What could law students do or what should, um, you know, aspiring lawyers or people thinking about go, to have that wider view uh, other than come to Duke Law School and, you know, be one of my students. I'm, I'm sure that would be part of your answer. <laughs> yeah, it, um, number one, it, law school is still a wonderfully uh, arming school to how you deal with life. If you think of life uh, as a wonderful game, uh, law, I, I think law school gives you a lot, but I would suggest that you minor in history and that you read broadly how other people dealt successfully or unsuccessfully with problems and understand that history is always fits and starts, that perfection is never achieved. I mean, we're building a country here. It's hard work, it's noble work. Some people are brought up the idea, well, America's built, so why isn't it perfect? Well, as a World War II Marine put it, America didn't have to be perfect to be worth fighting for because it's always getting better. It's actually designed to get better. It's designed to look at what's going on and say, that's not good enough for a more perfect union. So we just keep working at it. And to look back at history and say, well, we didn't do the right thing in 1619 when we imported a birth defect from the old world. You're damn right we didn't. And 600,000 Americans died settling the issue in our, in our civil war. So you keep looking at the ones like Martin Luther King Jr., you look at uh, Abe Lincoln, you look at Washington, and you look at imperfect people trying to make it a more perfect union. And you use history as your guide so that you know that people in many cases had to balance idealism with pragmatism. And they were never satisfied with where they got to, but Hegel's dialectic took over. And you had a thesis, you came up with an antithesis, and out of that came a synthesis. And that's not the end of it. That's the new problem. So you come up with a thesis, an antithesis, and you just keep going. And you don't condemn those who think we're going too fast, they want to slow down. And you don't condemn those who want to go faster, you work it out between you. Truman was asked, you know, what, uh, or uh, who is it, Van Vandenberg, Senator Vandenberg of Michigan, right-wing conservative Republican, was asked, how can you work with that son of a gun, it was worse than that, the word used, uh, left-wing socialist Truman. Uh, and Vandenberg said, when it comes to national security, politics end at the water's edge. Well, now I'd say if all politics are local, Politics need to end at the nearest stream's edge. We need to work together in this country and history will show us how to do it. There's nothing wrong with, with, with litigation and working things out in courts if you can't mediate it and you can't re resolve it otherwise. But we're starting to paralyze things and turn into such a legalistic society that our very efforts to make a more perfect union are becoming impositions instead of dialogues where we draw people together. 
Look at how Mandela and de Klerk worked together after a hateful, hateful regime of apartheid is taken apart. Look at Mannerheim putting Finland back together twice in his lifetime. Look at Ulysses Grant, what he did to bring the country back together after that civil war. It wasn't like the war is over and everybody's happy to happy go lucky now. You know, it was a hard, hard feelings and what he did. But there are examples in history that'll make you more human if you spend time uh, studying it. Well, I, I happen to really agree with that. And, and that, that is really such a, such a great way of putting it. It's, as someone with a Jesuit education, uh, you know, you're, you're speaking my language. But uh, let me ask you a couple really, really tough ones. Uh, my friend Beth Van Schack uh, has asked, uh, what were your views of the uh, pardons of the individuals, uh, the military individuals uh, that took place? Do you, do you have a view on that or? Well, you, you, uh, this is where I think you say, well, he has the legal authority to pardon them. And so you can dislike it that, you know, there it is. This is why I think we need to get back to looking at the legal system as a part of the justice system, not the whole entirety of it. Uh, justice is holding ourselves to a standard uh, that whether you use, I mean, I remember once I had, I had 500 some odd Marines around me, gathered around me in a formation. I said, just everybody get up as close to me as you can, the front rank you get down. And I just stood there looking at them for about 10 minutes. And that's uncomfortable for that many Marines sitting within a couple feet of a two-star general. And I said, young men, you have disappointed me. And then I didn't say another word for five minutes as I looked at everyone. Until they look away, I'd hold everyone's eye until they glanced away. And I said, this will never happen again. Never happen again. And then we just stood there. And then for about another 15 minutes, I stood there. And I said, now, it's over. Now we're going to talk about going forward. And it took probably another hour to get them into a Q&A mode and close the gap that I'd created there. Now, I could have initiated court martial on probably a half a dozen people in that organization. I did better at restoring good order and discipline by standing that close to an entire battalion of Marines that I'd had to bring in another battalion to stand their posts in a very dangerous area just to pull them together like that. And they understood that this was never going to happen, and, and it didn't, and it would turned into a great battalion. I think that what we've got to do is we've got to look at what kind of society do we want, and legal, you know, we want the rule of law, but legal processes are brittle. They're as brittle as battlefields at times, I think, and what we really want is to start rewarding virtue. And I don't think in any way, shape or form, not in terms of compassion, not in terms of recovery, of resilience, of good order, none of that was served by the way in which those, those uh, pardons were given. You know, uh, another tough one, I and this 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 really is a tough one. You might have heard the last uh, panel. We talked a lot about the role of retired military mm -hmm. officers and speaking out and and so forth. What what's your view of that? It, it captures a number of different questions we've gotten in the Q and A. Um, what is your view of retired officers speaking out? You know, some people say there's a there's a norm against it. Some people say no, we need that. Uh, what's your view? And you've been amazingly reticent with, with a few notable exceptions. And personally, I hope that we do hear more from you. But how can we, is there a way of having a norm of what is appropriate and what is not appropriate, or, or should it be total silence? Um, there, you know, it shouldn't be total silence. <clears throat> 
General Bradley, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said when an officer retires their uniform, general officer retires their uniform, they should retire their tongue on political matters um, as well. And uh, I mean, I didn't search out the job as SecDef. I'd been the executive secretary for two secretaries of defense. I knew what it was like to get woken up every night uh, to have holidays uh, where you didn't have holidays. Uh, the two secretaries I'd seen, both in the Clinton administration, good men, Senator Cohen, Dr. Perry, uh, I'd woken them up too many times. I knew what it was like for them to carry the nuclear codes and get that brief. Uh, and uh, no, no human being has the right to kill a million people, and yet that's basically what that brief is about. Um, so I didn't, want, I didn't go searching for the job, but I come from a background where if a president, Republican, or Democrat asks you to do something, you do it, if you're prepared to do it. Uh, when there came a point, uh, I'm from the West, I don't trifle with people, but I won't be trifled with. Uh, when it came a point where I couldn't do the job in good faith, in, in, in full faith, uh, then I said, that's it. And I'm from the West, uh, where we think, unlike Washington, D.C., actions speak louder than words. Uh, I quit on that president, and I put out a page and a half letter, why, about the way he was treating allies, and, and, his, uh, and privately about his contempt for the intelligence community, which is the best intelligence community in the world. And so there is nothing more that I needed to say. Now, when a, when a red line of tradition is breached, like at Lafayette Square, where people who were not at that time in any way violent see uniform military, even if they're National Guard, pushing them out, that was a time to speak out. But I'm against uh, what some of my friends have done. They're my friends, they'll be my friends forever. I was on the battlefield with some of them, but I completely disagree with a person saying everyone active and retired should vote for Hillary or someone who leads chance of lock her up. Uh, I think these are gross violations of the apolitical tradition. And I don't know how a president looks around the groom of officers if they're going to get out and right away start taking partisan positions, how open can that president be in, in front of them? And so I think George Washington and George C. Marshall are rolling over in their grave right now about some of these uh, folks. If you don't want to be a general, then don't be a general. But even to this day, even though I've been a secretary and I've been, even in my hometown, people call me general. Uh, you can't give it up. So don't think you're now speaking just for yourself. So I, I think generals need to get out of it. If they want to run for office, that's different. Run for office, throw your hat in a ring, that, that's okay. I don't, I don't care, Any, anybody can do that. But I think uh, generals need, need to retire their tongues on political matters. Well, thank you very much, sir. Unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. You, you did answer uh, two of my great students, Andrea Shackling and, and Victoria Morgan about balancing uh, your your ethics and, and your duties. And I think you, you've just given us so much. I can't begin to tell you how much I appreciate it and how much I know this audience has. It really means a lot that you've taken this time to share with us your, your thoughts. And I'm hoping that we'll continue to hear from you. And of course, you're always welcome back. And, and thank you again, sir. And Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. I, I, I don't forget my debt to my friend who stuck by me when I was in the soup, Charlie. So thank you. <laughs> and for all you young people, remember, uh, we're building the country here and we need every one of you guys and gals in there rolling up your sleeves and doing it. And uh, especially working with those you disagree with. Uh, actually search them out. Uh, take them down for a beer or root beer. Uh, you know, start working with those you disagree with. That's what this country's built on. And, uh, and no, no, no one's beyond the pale. No one's a socialist or a communist or a deplorable work together. Uh, you know what it was like, those of you in the military. Uh, this is a country that was based on everybody working together. So let's get back to it. And uh, thanks for having me, Charlie. Good luck to all of you. Thank you so much, sir. 
and for everybody, we'll we'll be back. Uh, I'm sure that uh, 